Hello and a very warm welcome on behalf of uh, NTI Audio. The topic of today are sound level measurements in an industrial environment. And this comprises three fields. Actually, the protection of your employees against excessive noise, which is required by national standards in the industrial countries. We have the demand to monitor the workplace noise over a certain period of time to determine the noise dose to which your workers are exposed. And a different topic would be the analysis of machinery noise to understand the behavior of the machine or to improve, to minimize the radiated noise level. My name is Marcus Becker. I'm the technical director here at NTI Audio. And today I'm assisted by Paul Sinclair, our marketing specialist. He will take care of your questions and comments during the webinar. The topics that we have prepared for you start with an introduction into some basics of sound level measurements, followed by typical application examples. Then we will tell you something about the microphone and the general preparations that need to be done before you start a measurement. We have also prepared a practical presentation for you. We will tell you something about sound exposure level and summarize the whole presentation at the end. I expect the webinar duration in the range of about half an hour. Let us start first with some basics of sound level measurements. And here, the topic of weighting or averaging plays a key role. Actually, we have two different weightings. Start, let's start with the frequency weighting. The frequency weighting represents the human hearing perception. We humans have a less high sensitivity in the lower frequency or in the upper frequency range. If you look at the green curve labeled A here, this is a typical average uh, hearing perception of a human being. And this curve has been standardized and represented by filters which are implemented on professional test instruments that can be activated. So as soon as this filter is active, the overall result, the wide band level result, for instance, will represent very closely our human perception about the level of a noise. The C weighting, the blue curve, is, has the same theoretical back, uh, background. It is just representing the behavior of the human here at higher levels. On the other side, we have the so-called Z weighting, which is a little bit misleading because it actually means that is the unweighted um, processing of the sound level, which means that here we have no filter applied. The test instrument will very accurately determine the corresponding level over the full audio band without any weighting. The A and the C weighting are typically used in environments where we want to measure the perception of the human here, where we have we're talking about the noise dose or applications where we are, uh, the humans in that room play a major role, whereas the Z weighting is more a technical um, application. Here, for instance, we would use it for machinery noise analysis. The second way of um, Weighting a signal would be the time weighting. You can see here these three uh, schematically drawn uh, responses of the test instruments to a sharp increase of a sound pressure level. The blue curve is a sharp, represents a sharp increase of the sound pressure level, and the dotted curves show you how quickly the test instrument responds to this sharp rise of sound pressure level. Impulse and fast are very quickly responding to that. Um, slope, whereas the slow time weighting has a higher inertia, it's a little bit a slower response, and thus it um, covers better, for instance, in, in applications where you have quickly changing sound pressure levels, it will be a more quiet display of the test result. And secondly, talking about time weighting or averaging, 
we have to mention the LEQ. LEQ stands for the Equivalent Continuous Sound Level, and this is actually the most popular, the most frequently used and standardized measure when it goes into the um, exposure of people to noise, to measure this exposure. The LEQ is an integrated uh, level, so it averages in a way the event, the sound pressure level that happened over time. The blue curve here shows you the, the instantaneous sound pressure level over time, whereas the red curve would show you the LEQ result. So you see that is averaging what has happened throughout the period of, uh, at which we are looking. Another term we have to clarify is the frequency resolution. First of all, let's talk about the wideband level. So this is a single value result measured over the audio band saying from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This value typically when we have, for instance, an A-weighted level measurement would represent our human hearing. On the other side, when we want to take a closer look at the noise, when, when we want to understand the characteristic of that noise or when we want to get an information about the sound source at which frequencies it generates higher levels or lower levels, then we have to take a look at the spectrum of that noise. And this is typically done by octave or third octave analysis or if you're looking for higher resolution by means of FFT. So these two spectral analysis methods allow a higher and more detailed analysis of the incoming sound. Some application examples. Let's start with machinery noise analysis. Here, for instance, we want to characterize, we want to evaluate the noise emitted by a motor or a generator, for instance. We want to understand at which frequencies this motor creates the sound. In a second step, we may try to improve that emitted sound, for instance, by reducing it, by making the generator more silent. And here we need to compare, of course, the measures that we have taken. So we are first measuring the generator before we take anything, uh, we, we uh, install uh, such a sound absorber, and then afterwards, and then we can verify the effect the result of our measures. On the other side, we have environmental noise analysis. So here we are mainly talking about sound exposure level of the workers in a factory, for instance, or also the term noise dose is typically used for this application. Some words about the measurement microphone. We differentiate the typical types of mic microphones by um, classes. Class 1 is the highest class that has a very linear frequency response. These microphones are very stable over time, but also versus temperature changes or changes in the relative humidity. So these limits, these specification limits are pretty tight. On the other side, we have the class two measuring microphones where these specification limits are a little bit wider. Still, they're good enough to execute, for instance, machinery noise analysis. The microphones are, of course, less expensive. So the selection of the microphone depends on your application. Keep in mind when you want to have a law-proof microphone, when you have to do a measurement that might be used in a court case, then you have to go for the class one not on the microphone, but also for the class one test instrument. Second, and that is very important, you need to calibrate the microphone every time you do a measurement. Um, what does it mean? The microphone capsule, each microphone capsule has an individual ratio by which it translates the incoming sound pressure into a voltage. And this voltage is then analyzed and quantified by the test instrument. This sensitivity needs to be measured exactly and calibrated. The microphones that we from NTI are supplying have a built-in chip that has, uh, that's, has saved this sensitivity information. So the test instruments will automatically read out that information and correctly calculate the corresponding level. 
However, it is recommended to verify the sensitivity from time to time by putting a microphone calibrator onto that uh, system and just to make sure that there are no major changes, which may, for instance, occur if you change your local position, for instance, when you go on a high mountain with a very lower air pressure, there might be some changes, but it is anyway recommendable to verify this calibrated sensitivity from time to time. Another step that needs to be done before you start the measurement is to adjust the input range, and this is the sensitivity of the test instrument. The goal here is that you want to measure as accurate as possible, and that means that you, of course, want to avoid any clipping, which would mean that the incoming noise would exceed the allowed input range of your instrument. But on the other side, you also don't want to um, activate a very high input range in a very silent environment, because then you would lose a lot of dynamic, we would lose a lot of measurement accuracy. Here on the left hand side you see a scale with three different bars and they represent the input ranges which are supported by the XL2 instrument. The green one would be for the very low, the very silent environments. The blue one is a mid-range, uh, you see it also on the screenshot that has been selected. And the orange bar would be activated for the very loud environments. And second, before you start the measurement, you have to make up your mind what results do you want to see, what results do you want to log to the uh, in, uh, internal SD card of that instrument. And uh, then when you have made this selection, you may start the recording, you may start the measurement. So we are already at the point of our practical presentation. I have here on my desk an XL2 instrument, which is connected to a microphone, which is placed in front of a small electromotor. I have connected the XL2 to my PC via USB link to allow you watching the content, the screen content of the XL2. Keep in mind when you um, connect the XL2 to a microphone, you can plug that microphone directly onto the device. Here I have a cable in between. The cable connection has two advantages. First of all, it allows you to um, place the microphone in a definitive, in a, in a, in a defined position where you don't have to stand aside. You, you avoid acoustical reflections. And especially in harmful environments, it is of course beneficiary to have only the microphone placed in there, whereas you, for instance, can be standing or sitting in the room next to it and still monitor the results that are acquired through that microphone. And another issue to be considered is when you do comparative measurements, uh, you should always make sure that this microphone is placed in a reproducible position so that the acoustical behavior of the room in which you are has no impact on the test, on the test result by comparing it from one step to the next one. You see here now the screen content of my XL2, and actually this is the third octave screen. You see here the spectrum of my voice. I'm going to be silent just in a minute. I only want to let you uh, guide you three, uh, shortly through the um, key um, settings. You have here the selection whether you want to apply a weighting. I have decided for the Z weighting because I'm talking about a um, technical measurement fast time waiting, I can decide whether I want to see the maximum, minimum, or live, and so on. I have selected the third octave resolution. I could also go for the octave, but uh, third octave has a higher resolution. And I have adjusted the cursor to automated, which means that it always will follow the peak level in my spectrum. Now I'm going to switch on my motor, and you will see what is going to happen there. Yeah, I actually forgot one thing. I had wanted to start my measurement because what you saw here was just the spectrum of the motor, but you did not see the maximum level. Sorry, I forgot that. I'm going to do it again.
Maybe you noticed that in between there was a there was a um, peak noise. Actually, I compromised a little bit the gearbox of my motor here, which resulted in a, a kind of a creaking noise. And you see that here the cursor shows you here at about four kilohertz there was this peak created by this uh, compromised behavior. And you see also these bars over here, this is the maximum that uh, occurred during the measurement. Now, if I want to take a closer look at this effect here, I can repeat that, but this time I will do it with the FFT just because it has a higher resolution. I start my measurement. Um, you see, the same thing happened. We had a bar, a, a peak here at 4 kilohertz. I can, by the way, use my cursor also in manual mode to scroll through this um, screen here and look for the exact frequency of that bar. So you see here it's in the range of 4 kilohertz. I could even zoom out my screen to get an even more detailed uh, feedback. So this picture here shows me in more detail the spectrum of my device. Keep in mind that the X scale of the FFT is linear, whereas the X scale of the third octave was logarithmic. And that is also the reason why you're seeing this peak here more to the left of the screen compared to the previous screen with the third octave measurement. I have many more possibilities in my Excel tool, for instance, I can say I want to know the difference between my live level and a previously defined reference measurement. So this would be here live minus, and then I'm selecting here a previous measurement, and then you just need to adjust the scaling. And you see here around this zero line, so this is the difference between the current situation and the one that I had recorded before. I'm going to restart my motor for a minute. So you have seen that as soon as the motor was running, there was a very small deviation. So the situation apparently was very similar. But uh, as soon as we apply uh, shielding, you would immediately see the direct difference between the status previous and afterwards on that screen. Good, let us get back to the presentation, to the slideshow. And let's talk a little bit about sound exposure level, LEX. The definition of this measurement is again an integration of the sound pressure level over time. There are two major standards in the world, in the European Union and in the United States. The OSHA stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. HC means hearing conservation and PEL, permissible exposure level. So there are individual standards behind these terms. And what do they say? Let's take a look here at the table. For instance, if your workers are exposed to an LAX value uh, of higher than 80 dBA or 135 dB LC peak. In that case, you needed to offer them individual hearing protectors. If you exceed the 85 dBA in your factory floor, these hearing protectors are compulsory, so your workers have to use them. And if you exceed the 87 dBA, you even have to select these individual hearing protectors in a way that they are optimized for the spectrum of the noise that is present in your factory. So these have to be really dedicated hearing protectors to be used. We at NTI, we offer you a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, where you can import the logged measurement data from your Excel tool, and it will directly show you the corresponding result of these standards so that you know in which of these ranges you are. One more hint, 
uh, if you are responsible for such a measurement for the uh, hearing protection of your workers. Keep in mind that there are also other measures that can be taken. Of course, you can always damp the noise of the machinery where the uh, sound is coming from. You can also, for instance, improve the room acoustics. You can reduce the reverberations in your room. And all these measurements related to these um, possible approaches can be executed with the Excel tool. Talking about reverberation time, for instance, we have already had a webinar on that recently. You will find that webinar on our website. And uh, so please take a look if you want to know more about that. Coming to the summary of what we have presented to you today, when we talk about professional sound level measurements, please keep in mind to use professional test equipment. This may sound a little bit silly, but uh, you know that there are lots of apps floating around for Android, iMac, whatever. Um, these apps give you a certain assessment um, of the situation, but they are never replacing a professional test equipment because they are lacking a calibrated and linear microphone. They are lacking the acoustical uh, correct design of that mic microphone and they cannot replace a really uh, calibrated or precise professional test equipment. Keep in mind to calibrate your test system, including the sensor. Uh, in this line I wrote sensor, which can stand for microphone, which can also stand for a vibration sensor. It is also possible to connect a vibration sensor to your test instrument, like the XL2, to measure the corresponding vibrations of the motor, for instance. Remember to adjust the input range of your test instrument and select the relevant and mandatory measurements and weightings before you start the measurement. The last step is to take care that this test is also executed correctly, that the microphone position makes sense and then you need to do this last uh, selection whether you want to log the acquired data over time or log the final data that you have acquired. This is optional, but it is talking about the Excel 2 also supported by default. Well, we are at the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Contact us. I will take a look on the questions that have come in during that webinar just in a minute. But <clears throat> if you need more information or if uh, you have forgotten something to ask right now, you can contact us at any time in the future. Our subsidiaries worldwide will be happy to support you. We also have independent sales partners around the world, so they are all ready and skilled and experienced to answer to your demands. For the time being, I'm saying thank you very much and hope to see you again soon in the near future. Thank you and bye-bye.